The small voice repeated, Please, sir, if you will be so kind. Kieran looked about but saw no person or creature addressing him. Pray thee, he cried, show thyself or have cause to fear my dagger. He tried disparately to remember where he had last seen it. <laughs> Whether thee be friend or foe, pray thee show thyself now. The small voice replied from above him, Kind sir, thou hast no cause to fear me, and I am in need of help. Can you find it in thy heart to aid me? He looked up and saw naught but a small robin's nest, three branches above him. Climbing swiftly, he found a robin with three tiny robinlings, their mouths open wide. Good mother robin, he asked. Can it be thee who addresses me thus? Cancer, she replied. I have hurt my wing, and it will be at least a day before I might fly. If my children do not eat soon, they will die. Would you be so kind as to pr bring a fat, juicy meal? Would you find a caterpillar or ease, earthworm or grub for my children? Now Kiran was kind of hard, and it was not within him to refuse a plea such a, as a, this. So off he went into the forest, searching under some mulberry leaves. He soon found a small green caterpillar. It seemed a perfect meal for young robins. Plucking it from the leaf up on which it fed, he prepared to hurry back to the oak when he heard a tiny voice. He opened his hand and the caterpillar looked up at him with her big brown eyes wide with fear. Kind sir, she said. Wouldst thou kill me so thoughtly, thoughtlessly? Kiran scratched his head in puzzlement, and the caterpillar continued. Then thou cooled thy feet beneath the oak. Didst thou not find joy in my parents, beauty as they dance before thee in the sun? I, too, am soon there to change. Wouldst thou deny thou thy sickness? successors, the joy of my dancing, and if I do not live to have children, how will thin own children find such joy? Please, sir, would not an earthworm serve the needs of the robinlings just as well? Kiran looked into the eyes of the caterpillar and knew that he could not feed her to the robins. Carefully he placed her beneath her mulberry bush and continued his search. Near a rushing brook, Kiran found a flat stone that, when moved, revealed a juicy ear earthworm enjoying the cool moist earth. Aha, he thought, as nice as the caterpillar may have been, this truly seems a more fitting meal for young robins. He had no sooner plucked the earthworm from its cool world, where it had been frantically trying to burrow away from him, when the when he heard a voice of faint, he might have imaged it. Cancer, he thought, he heard, and Kiran looked in his hand. The worm continued, I am but a lowly creature. It's true, but might I plead such case that I have? Kiran rolled his eyes skyward as the worm sat up and seized its ch chance. I'm not a low-born worm like others you might find. No, I am a prince among earthworms. I come from an ancient lineage. My ancestors buried the earth when fires belched from black pits throughout these lands. I command millions like myself. Were it not for my loyal followers, you good sir would be up to your neck in leaves, tree trunks and moldy carcasses. I make a bargain with you. If you release me and choose instead a pathetic grub for the rebellings, I will dispatch an entire clan of earthworms to keep your fore foreyard clean and sweet smelling, for as long as ye shall live. The earthworm looked helpfully at Kieran while calculating the distance to the ground. Good sir, what say ye? Kieran was beginning to lose his pa patience. But seeing the value of the earthworm's offer, decided that a grub would indeed make a tasty morsel for the young robins. He returned the earthworm to its moist heaven and carefully replaced the flat stone above it. And true 
to his desire a short while later in a forest glade beneath a wild slab of discarded bark, Curran chanced upon that which he sought, a fat wild scrub that would grow the revelings into beautiful songsters. He plucked it from his its hiding place and set forth. It was a beautiful day, indeed. Seconds! Nearby in stately Tarobridge, King Kaladan did live with his lovely daughter, Ain Lear. The princess was the apple of... Ich glaube, das ist jetzt eine komplett andere Geschichte, oder? Naja, es wäre schon nicht gewesen, herauszufinden, was jetzt aus den kleinen Vögeln geworden ist. Ich glaube nämlich, so lange wie der gebraucht hat, sind sie schon halb am Sterben gewesen. Ich meine, die waren ja schon hungrig, vielleicht sind sie mittlerweile verhungert. Keine Ahnung. Naja, second. Nearby in Stately Trowbridge, King Caladian did live with his lovely daughter, Ainlia. The princess with was the apple of the old man's eye and the crown jewel of his small kingdom. He looked upon her with the blind pride of a do doting father, and she, for her part, did not by but busk and flourish in his bounty. Trowbridge was quiet now, the chief sounds being the clatter of cart wheels and the cries of street vendors. But it was not always so. Three years earlier there had been trouble with Carton, Carton to the best. It was not much, a border dispute, but the king persuaded a wizard named Loziard to come to Trowbridge in his employee, employ, to aid him in the contest. Loziard was unknown by all in Trowbridge and kept to himself within the palace, coming and going as he pleased. When Trowbridge prevailed, prevailed with almost no less of life, there was joyous celebration for days and weeks thereafter. Time passed, yet Lazir remained. The king, not wanting to seem ungrateful, said nothing, but became increasingly discomforted with the wizard's presence and wished for the, his departure. On Aenlir's 20th birthday, King Caladan called for a celebration and holiday through all his land, announced to his subjects he intended to proclaim his retirement and the transference of his crown to his beautiful daughter. Out of politeness and nothing more, he invited the wizard Loziard to aid him in devising a proper speech. Loziard was fu furious. He paced his chamber, his black bows, brows knitted with intensity that would have sought any cow's milk. Why, he cried aloud, am I treated so unjustly by the old buffoon? Where it's not for my skills, the border contests, mayhaps even the kingdom itself, might have been lost. I deserve more. I deserve the crown to give it to that primping, simpering daughter of his, who thinks not of more than her own whim. Is a slap more stinging than that of Gauntlet? All to see, wherein lies true power. Thereupon Loziard made his preparations. Princess Enlia's birthday came in a summer morning. On a summer morning. Everyone within the city and from the farms without gathered to the palace for the festival. Banners waved from every rooftop. Fiddlers filled and dancers danced. Bakers baked wonderful sweets for the occasion. It was a day long to be remembered. At noon, precisely, King Caladan and Princess Ainlir Ein Ein emerged onto the main balcony to the cheers of the kingdom. Good citizens of Trowbridge, called the king, we are but a tiny kingdom, but we prosper, do we not? Do we not? Loud hails, mostly, erupted from the crowd below. Encouraged, Caladan and continued, but now I am an old man. The day has arrived when younger blood can better attend to the needs of eva and events of the kingdom. My subjects, my loyal subjects and friends, it is with honor and pride and the greatest of ex expectations that I transfer my kingdom and my crown to my loving daughter, 
One and all, I give you a long pause here. Ain the air. As cheers filled the air. Kaladan made a grand, sweeping gesture with his arm, intending to make the presentation as spectacular as the pride that filled him. His friend swoosh, and his hand pointed to nobody. What was this? Where had she gone? Where Emily had been? Moments earlier, there were no was not but the camped air. Er, and Lear? He called, uncertainly. But there was no response. Silence fell over park and courtyard. People glanced at each other nervously. Old Loziard clapped his hands in glee. He danced. He hugged himself with uncontained laughter. How wonderful, he cried. What a brave, breathtakingly stunning and talented a wizard I am. For what he had done, of course, was to rid himself of Enlir for once and for all. With one stroke crafted evil, he had removed the vain creature from the palace. Not else remaining remained between him and death which he desired. No, magic is a tricky thing, like all forces in the world. It must be kept in balance, as surely as day balances night and summer balances winter. So too must positive magic balance negative. For every hurtful of or destructive spell, there must be an act of equal goodness or charity lest trouble overflow into the world. For every black wizard there must be a white. For every spell of combat destruction there must be healing. Now ye this. If all who practice magic cast naught but healing or protective spells, dark horrible forces would build up until chaos and rain would burst forth and rain, our doom would down upon us. Thus may spells of healing be broken by harm and the worst of spells be broken by charity. Knowing this, Luziat planned well his act of vengeance, to permanently rid himself of Enlir, short of killing her outright, he must devise a spell so cunning that no act of kindness would ever break it. Ever break it. He was pulling lies out of this his long beard, late one evening, when he burst into laughter. He would make her into something disgusting. I will make her into a frog. He laughed. Then frowned. No. That had been done. People might expect it and go around like mindless idiots seeking frogs hoping to earn a king's ransom. And then a brilliant plan occurred to him. I will make her into a bug. An insect. A worm. He almost choked on his wine. Oh, how perfect. I will make her into something so truly lo loathsome that she will spend the rest of her little bug life in terror of being squashed by the first person who sees her. He squealed and his rings jingled and his fat jiggled and he snorted wine out of his noise in laughter. Oh, how absolutely delicious. And that's exactly what he did. While King Kaladan and his subjects scratched their hands and puzzlement, nobody saw a small fat white tree grub plop to the cobblestones beneath the main balcony and immediately curl up, glistening and quivering. Das ist echt fies, ich mag den Zauber nicht, das ist volles Arschloch. Drittens, and Leah was terrified, what that had happened? Well, she had seen enough of Lizard's magic to know what had happened. But why? Why would he do this to hear her? She didn't have long to ponder the question. A huge black hound, hundreds of times her size, ran to the cobblestone where she lay and almost gobbled her with one slurp of his tongue. From somewhere she found the wherewithal to roll out of his way and into the crevice between the stones. His huge slurpy tongue followed her, drawling and panting great hurricanes of hot awful breath down, down at her. But just as the tongue was about to lick her into the waiting stomach, the hound's owner 
ch yanked his massive chain and pulled the beast towards home. Toward home. It is true that Inlia in her life as a human was self-indulgent indulgent and not inclined to effort or resource, but that was merely because she had no need of either. In the following days she had cause this to discover plenty of both within her. After the incident with the hound she knew she must go far away from people and dogs, and she knew what kinds of creatures dined on crabs too. She slept out of sight under leaves, in places where grubs would not likely be sought. Even so, in these days were filled with terror and adventure. There were circling hawks by day and owls by night, a bear tearing at a rotting tree trunk, gobbled grubs and being indistinguishable from Elia by the hundreds as she watched in horror from behind a nearby rock. The smallest stream was now an enormous gushing torrent to be crossed in a nutshell under the greatest of peril. Nelia passed this test, along with many others, and she passed them well. It was on her tenth such day that he clumsy, a clumsy boot kicked aside the piece of bark under which she had sought shelter from the sun. Blinded by the sudden light, she heard an ex exclamation from high above. Then, before she could react, two fingers dropped from the sky and plucked her up and deposit deposited her firmly inside a huge fist. Ten days ago, and Leah would have been paralyzed with terror, but that was ten days ago. Her mind raised, who is this clumsy idiot anyway? She thought, and what on earth does he want with a tree grub? At least he didn't squash me on the spot. That's encouraging, isn't it? So he must be here to rescue me. She wriggled and squirmed in his first until she could see his face high above her. Between two of his fingers. Ah, a bird! If I'm going to be rescued, why can't it be by a fine young prince? But it's then occurred to her that she was speaking could have survived these past 10 days. She laughed, thinking of them. Not many, I bet. Those who wouldn't have curled up and died immediately would by now be whimpering and crying for their mothers. She looked at Kieran again. Well, maybe he would look better if I wasn't looking straight up his nostrils. Ouch, why isn't he more careful with careful with me? Ah, the Geschichte geht doch noch weiter, that's toll, with the Kieran. And then it occurred to Elena that if this oaf were truly rescuing her, he probably would have said something to her. Ooh, oh, and Leah's heart raced and she started wriggling furiously, imagining the worst of all possible deaths. He must be going fishing. And Leah couldn't do much in her current state, but she could spit, and spit she did, in quantities unimaginable for so small a grub. She spit and spit and spit until her tiny grub mouth was tr too dry to spit another drop. She felt Kieran's hands scrumming and thought, it's working! Fittens! Kieran was very disgusted. It was bad enough that he had to touch this slimy thing, but now it was oozing something and becoming truly ro revolting. Finally, just before he reached the robin's oak, he could take it no longer. He stopped and examined the creature in his hand. White and plump and glistening it was, in truth a repellent creature. Yet the poor thing was obviously terrified. He gazed up at him with what he imagined, imagined to be minuscule grub eyes, pleading Kieran thought of the caterpillar and the earthworm, and his heart gave in. Having a great resigned sigh, he found a nice clean root and placed the grub upon it. And thus was Lozia's spell broken. None could have been more astonished than Inlia when she 
unexpectedly grew to her form of size. Expect perhaps for Kieran, who nearly died of fright. He was no more than catching his breath when Emilia regained her wits. Raising her index finger, warning Kieran not to say even one word, Emilia snatched Kieran's coat to cover herself. Ah, die ist nackt gewesen, <laughs> so wie es aussieht. Um, then, with fire in her eyes and as much dignity as she could master, she was off to Trowbridge, leaving Kieran to stare up and mouth at her departing figure. Lia knew she could not simply enter the city and confront Lozyard. The moment he saw her, he would be but cast another herself as a shepherd. She found an abandoned house on the moors and began to make her plans. What happened next is a tale worth hearing, but it is a tale for another evening. Indeed, it is a tale to be told over many an evening and many a good spot of ale. And what of the baby ri robins? Having no alternative, Kieran climbed the tree and took from his pack his last piece of fatty rubbed mutton. Tearing it into small shreds, he gave it to the grateful mother Robin, who fed it to her family. Upon returning to the ground, Kieran looked first towards Fair Tree, his former destination, then grinning, set off after the. Da, da, da steht noch ein Buchstabe. Seht ihr das? Das ist noch ein Buchstabe. Um, the many question, main question was, 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 who knows, he called back to the robins, it may be fate and besides I need my coat. He was heard late that evening far down the road, singing, oh the maidens of Trowbridge are passing fair, with breasts like melons and flaxen hair. Okay, um, haben wir doch gelesen, dann verkaufen wir die dreimal. Set. 